what we're going to talk about today is not fret. What we're going to talk about today is single molecule experiment, which actually fret can be a single molecule experiment, and we'll have time to talk about that. But today we're going to talk about a single molecule experiment and how to get nanometer accuracy, nanometer resolution. We'll discuss the difference between accuracy and resolution. And in particular, accuracy, tell me, what is accuracy and what is resolution? Who can tell me? Sort of weird. Good. Why don't you talk about it yourself for a minute? Resolution is as small as possible. You can see if you can get the resolution down to the there's only two of them. Okay. Who, who can tell me what accuracy is it and what is resolution? What about accuracy? You, you must have had some ideas. Go ahead, you're, you're smiling a lot. Tell me, what, what is accuracy? Okay, so if, if you have a point object and accuracy is, can you locate it where it is? It's here or it's here or it's here. You can tell me within a meter or a yard or a nanometer or whatever where it is. Okay? It. If it's an object here and there's, you know, let's say sunlight, it, it hits here and it hits in my eye, and I can see it accurately. Now the sun goes down, you know, and it's going down, there's not much light, and all of a sudden I can't see it so accurately, and we can't really tell whether it's here or it's here or it's here, okay? Good, that's what accuracy is. What's resolution? Yes, it's great. the precision of your measurements or how well you can distinguish two objects apart. Okay, well let's take the second one. Accuracy was how well on a single one you can tell exactly where it is. Resolution is now you have two molecules and how well you can tell what the distance is between them. Turns out that that's very important. In fact, if you can resolve very good accuracy, in fact, you can, if you have a whole bunch of molecules, you can say this is here, and this is here, and this is here, and you can trace out what the molecule is doing. And it turns out that this Fiona, everybody know who Fiona is? Who, who doesn't know? Everybody knows. Okay. So Fiona is a, actually it's an acronym. It stands for Fluorescence Imaging with One Nanometer Accuracy. And it, it says 
in fact, that you can determine accurately to about a nanometer or a nanometer and a half. Now, if you want nanometer resolution, so you have two of them, this has been a recent revolution in the field. In fact, it won the Nobel Prize for 2014. Three people won it. And it allows you to get nanometer resolution between two objects. And what we're going to do today is we're going to explain what Fiona is and what these resolution techniques. And in particular, they tend to go by the name of POM, which stands for photoactivated light, I don't know. So it goes for palm or storm. Essentially, they're the same thing. Yes? Uh, was that the Nobel Prize in physics? It was the Nobel Prize in chemistry. 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 Uh, okay. The reason, by the way, we're going over both of these, where ordinarily I would go over Fiona and then I would go over a storm or a palm, is this year you are doing both of them this week. There has been sort of a screw up and because next week is biophysical society, so there's no class, no lab, and so some of you are going to be doing Fiona this week, some of you are going to do storm, and then when you come back, you will actually do fret once again, and then it'll be mixed in. But you guys are very intelligent, so I'm sure you'll work it out. Okay? Now the question is, why is it so difficult to accurately pinpoint something or to resolve two objects that are closer together than, than something. For 400 years, let's say, do anybody know when the microscope was invented? Good guess. No, I, I think either it was 1461 or 1641. I don't know say four or five hundred years. The diffraction limit has been the limit of resolution. And the <coughs> diffraction limit was this, where D, the distance between the molecules, is equal to lambda over two times the numerical aperture. What's the numerical aperture? Anybody know? The what? D sine theta. D sine theta. I think there was a D somewhere. Oh. This is called the numerical aperture, which is basically you have an object and you're collecting the fluorescence at some angle. The bigger the angle, the larger the, the numerical aperture is. So if you're collecting 180 degrees, sine of 180 is what? Yeah, you're right. That's true. But it, you, you're actually measuring the half angle. So theta, theta, theta over 2 equals 90, so 1. So if n is 1, which n is the typical, well, if it's air, a, n is what? 1. It's the index of refraction. So this approach is 1. 
And it turns out that if you use N, as you commonly do, you use a, a water, then N is 1.33. If you use oil, it's N is 1.5. Doesn't matter. So you can get up to like 1.5. But for now, it, this is what the resolution looks like. It's lambda, which is the, the wavelength of emission, divided by 2 times about 1. So it's about lambda over 2. And lambda, it, and what, what it, the, if the, your fluorophore was, let's say, emitting in red, what, what it, wavelength is this? 600, uh, 633, but yeah, 600. So 600 divided by 2 means 300 nanometers is basically the limit of resolution. For that, for, for whatever, four or 500 years, that was the law. And, and it's been completely changed right now. And this is how it works. If you have a single object that is incredibly bright, but it doesn't matter how small that is, when you image it, you will get, this is a diffraction pattern, where the, the width is about 250 nanometers or 444, depending on you know whether you measure it down here or up here. It doesn't matter what the what the fluorophore is made of. It does matter its lambda, its wavelength, and it does matter about the index of refraction. So now, so what is accuracy? Accuracy is how well can you tell the center of this? That's the accuracy. That is, how well can you localize where the peak is? Okay, And we're going to show exactly what that is. Just, just wait a minute. Now resolution, here we have two objects. They're both clear. If they're sufficiently far apart, you measure this one and you measure this one, and they're far apart, they're resolved. Then, in fact, as you, they're starting to move closer together, the, they start to overlap. That's called the Rayleigh criteria. Okay. What, what is this distance? Well, it's basically when they're about lambda over 2 apart, which is, you know, on the order of 300 nanometers. And let's say now they actually become closer. In that case, it looks like one big blur, and you cannot resolve it. So that's typically the classical definition. So what they've done is they've done certain things. Okay? Okay. So we're going to understand what Fiona is. And let's first use an example. Let's say you have an isolated mountain. It's a single mountain, a single peak. And in which case, you can determine where the center of that peak is very well, in fact, infinitely well. That is, as long as there's a lot of photons, you know, shining off here and going in your eye. And it doesn't matter, in fact, that the peak may be one-tenth or one-one-hundredth or one-one-thousandth. The width, you can tell. 
where it is. Yes? The oh, this is exactly what you have in a microscope. That that single molecule is emitting, and it's emitting in in a cone. Actually, for those who are familiar with it, this is actually an airy disk. But for for our purposes, it's just as well to call it a Gaussian. And it has a width, and the width is lambda over 2, 250, 300 nanometers. But as long as there's enough photons shining in your eye or on, on the detector, you can determine the center arbitrarily well. How well is that? It turns out you can determine the center is equal to the width divided by the square root of n, where n is the number of total photons you've collected. So this peak happens to be 14,000 photons. I mean, th this is actually real data. Let's say it's 10,000. The square root of 10,000 is 100, good. So 250 divided by 100 is 2.5. And OK, it ends up being, it's essentially that divided by 2. So it, we've shown that you can d determine the, the center to what 1.3 nanometers if you get on the order of 10,000 photons. So this says it, it depends on the number of photons hitting your eye. So let's say that there's only 1,000 photons hitting your eye. What does that tell you? How accurately can you see it? Uh, how do you get that? Multiply by what? Rad what is rad? Oh, oh. Uh, right. The square root of uh, what we said a thousand is on the order of thirty-three. Two fifty. Let's two fifty divided by thirty-three. Well, that's about ten nanometers or so. So uh, this makes sense as the number of photons is decreasing, you have a tougher and tougher time telling where it is. It's just like the sun going down, you know, less photons hitting your eye. Okay? So what this does is if you attach the molecule to a, let's say, to a little motor, motors of walking around doing things in your cells. Each time the motor takes a step, you'll see the, the molecule taking a step. And as long as that step is si significantly greater than 1.3 nanometers, if you have 10,000 photons hitting you, you should be able to resolve that, what that is. Okay? And what we're going to do is actually do this. And that uh, I'm going to give you some examples, but you're actually going to measure this this week. Okay. Now the other situation is we want to get super resolution, that is a resolution much better than lambda over 2. <clears throat> and this is just the picture that I showed before. Under normal diffraction conditions, this is resolved, this is sort of barely resolved, and this is unresolved. So how do you, what trick 
do you do, do you do to make it such that you can now resolve this? A anybody know? It's it's actually a very simple trick. Now you probably and you probably know because somebody actually told you. If nobody had told you, you'd have a tougher time. And so for those of other people who have not been told, this is your chance to win a Nobel Prize. Because it, it was basically this idea that won them a Nobel Prize. So had, you have this, and somehow you have to have this, and you have to have th this sort of at separate times or something. Anybody have an idea, any idea aside from those two? Okay. So, anybody have an idea? Okay. God, nothing like personal. Get out. <laughs> okay. What you do is you use an activatable fluorophore. That is, you come and you take your molecules, your fluorophores, and you place them on actin or whatever. And at first, they're completely silent. So this is your signal. Then you go and you very weakly activate some of them. In particular, you've activated one of them just randomly. Now, now you can apply Fiona technique. You go and fit this to a Gaussian distribution. You can determine the width, uh, I'm sorry, the center position much more accurately than the width. In fact, you can fit it to something like 1.3 nanometers, depending on the number of photons, and you get this to 1.3 nanometers. Then, after a little while, the fluorophore photobleaches, stops emitting, and you're like this. And what do you do again? You go and you turn back randomly another guy. And you get this to 1.3 nanometers. And then you st store it in your computer so you know this is good to 1.3 nanometers. This is good to 1.3 nanometers. So the resolution of this is like on the order of 1.3 nanometers or that times the square root of 2, or something like that. So this is, in fact, super resolution. So now you can all go and walk up to Stockholm and say, I deserve the Nobel Prize. Yes? Um, so my question is, when you try to like, fix like, these uh, cells, what, how, how can we like, so accurately like, target together this, this molecule? Is this it's so close to each other? It, it, but what is happening is some photons are coming in and one, two, two of them are sitting there and one of them happens to absorb a photon. The other doesn't. You know, it's like, you know, you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. <laughs> it's true. It, it, when you're dealing with a, a single one, things are quantized. Or, you know. Okay? And, and so the fact that this guy is here doesn't in fact affect this, that this guy. Because you, you activate it in such a way it's a really low level activation. In fact, typically what you do is you activate it 
by shining in a UV photon? Well, it's not just one photon, but yes, it's one photon that actually gets absorbed and then induces a ch chemical transition which causes the molecule to be fluorescent. And then, and then what you do is you shine light, a whole bunch of light at it, and you cause it to, fl to actually fluoresce because now there's actually only one fluorescent molecule in there. And then it emits, and then it dies. And then you're, again, you, you have, you come in with your UV light, and one goes up, and you determine that again. So, so in, in the whole process, uh, you have like several rounds of excitation? Yes. So those molecules they are all fixed? And <coughs> the that is an excellent point. That you, you, there was a certain time that, that you activated the first one, then you induced it to fluoresce, it, it, it emitted photon, it dies, then you have to do it all again. The time resolution of this is very poor. In, in fact, the very first experiment on this was he looked at a cell and it took him 24 hours to actually image the cell. It was amazing. Now you can do it something like in a minute or two. Still, that's pretty lousy. I mean, we generally look, you know, 30 times a, a, a second. So it's pretty lousy. Now it turns out that there's another technique which we won't go over in class, which involves sophisticated uh, optics which can go up to 30 times a second. It, it doesn't get nearly as good resolution as this technique. This is palm or storm. But it, it can do it in general at much better time resolution. Yes? So when we're thinking of image this way, are we just taking several incomplete images with each ultraviolet flash and then just gluing them together? Exactly. Remember what I said is you, you get this one and you store it in your computer and then you take another one and you find this and you store it in your computer. Yes, each one is a, is a seriously incomplete picture of the thing. That is, it's a picture of what one guy is doing. And how can we know that we're not in the second run hitting the same molecule that we hit in the previous run? In fact, you don't. And sometimes uh, it, th this will completely overlap. Yet you don't. In fact, and sometimes uh, you'll get this one, and you'll then get another one. But actually, it's sufficiently close that the accuracy between these guys is pretty lousy because you don't have enough photons. And in fact, that will ultimately determine your resolution. Yes? Um, that wouldn't happen because wouldn't it follow glitch and then you wouldn't be able to anything Well, it, it's true. We're assuming it photo bleaches and it goes kaput and it's dead and you know. Now it turns out occasionally you go like that, whoa! And, and, that, and, that's and, a very bad like pregnant analogy. And that's, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> I'm left with nothing to say. <laughs> You know, you, you got. Wait, you, you have something else that I did wrong? No, 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 I was talking yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, it was real funny. <laughs> when uh, you shine the UV light, it 
turns on, like let's say by chance, it turns on two that are at the same place. Ah. Like you said, if that happens, wouldn't that ruin the whole sample? Because now you would have one site that's not continuing for so. That that that's a problem. In fact, let's say you you're not sure how much light to you know this UV light to put such that in general you know you'll get only one molecule and you won't get two. What do you do about that? How, how do you experimentally check for that? Okay, good. So the, the question is, you, you have your sample, it has a whole bunch that, that are labeled, and then you want to go and excite it with a UV light, and you want to make sure that you're not exciting two of them right next to each other such that they are both emitting. How do you control for that? This, okay, good. Think about it. That's right. Absolutely. And what what should you see? Uh, what? You take it at a very low level, and you'll get a, a certain resolution that is, you know, be able to to tell that there's a molecule here and there's a molecule here. And then, what kind of resolution will you get at higher laser intensities? Hmm. Why don't you think about it? activation threshold. So you have one that activates within you, one that activates what do you mean by Do you excite the one with lower uh, excitation energy first? These are identical oh, fluorophores. Identical. Oh, okay. identical fluorophores. So then you use a filter. No. And this, no, exactly the same. Because this is resolution, which is distinguishing exactly the same molecules. Okay. So let, uh, let, what do you got? Yes. So maybe when you have two that are two, so when there are two that are very close together that are fluorescing at the same time, despite using this technique, they should have an increase in intensity. So maybe you can cut off the intensity or something. That, 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 that's a good point. What the intensity of this should be twice the height of, or twice the integrated area of this. That, that's, in fact, a, a, a good thing that you can do. But it's just one of the things that you can do. Still, it doesn't tell you, you know, is that happening a lot or a little? What else? Charles? Yeah. Uh, I guess you could maybe limit the number of photons you're using to like, excite them. Good. Yes. Okay. How, how, how do you know what the limit is? 
How do you know? One spot per picture? Yeah, but how do you know that there is only one being activated? That's, yeah, but, but you, you see this, and, and the, this looks like one. Oh, you, you see this, there's got to be something that there, there are two spots that Yes, but it, right, but it doesn't tell you when you're getting two of them that are both emitting at the same time. Go ahead. Sure. You, uh, use an intensity beam statistically will only activate half of your floor cores, and then you just take a whole bunch of pictures. Okay. You, you get a process of Okay, <laughs> but wait. You take an intensity which will excite half the floor fours. How do you know what that intensity is? Uh, you have to experimentally verify it. Ha okay. Uh, you know, this is the, the real, real life. How are you going to experimentally do this. Yes? Uh, make sure that only, uh, in, on average, there's only one photon hitting in one uh, radio coherent distance. Okay. H how do you do that? Go for it. What? Calculate. Calculate? Oh, man. So, some of us don't know how to calculate. Did you go from like the lower limit to? Uh, go ahead. Lower. So like at one point, like you would be going from very low intensity, so that you don't see anything, and then just keep increasing until you see something. Okay. And, and, and if that thing that you see has double peak intensity, then you can lower it a bit more. Yeah, I'll go through a whole bunch of different intensities, trying to excite it, and then. You Bing, what is it? Bing, you know. Yeah, you got it. What you do is, you don't do any calculation. It, well, at least not much of one. You shine a bunch of different light, uh, laser intensities at it. First, you do it, you know, super low, and then what you do is you get a picture and you calculate what the resolution is. For example, in your picture, you know, you maybe have a microtubule here and a microtubule here, and at some point, you know, you can see them you know, it, 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 it looks like this, and this has a certain width or, you know, like this. And then you, you, you turn up the laser and turn up the laser and turn up the laser and it'll actually, it'll look like that. And eventually you turn it up such that, you know, let's say you're activating all of them. If you're activating all of them, what should the resolution be? Yeah. What? Not very. Lambda over two. Or two times the, the numerical aperture. So what you do is you just plot the amount of laser hitting your sample and the the resolution, I don't know, look, looks at over here, it's length lambda over <laughs> two. Here it's less, and it goes less. Well, at, at actually, at, at some point, it'll start increasing because you, you've, mm, no, 
No, it, it'll just take you forever to actually see the molecule because you're exciting with UV light, nothing's emitting, and then occasionally once every five minutes you get one photon, something like that. Okay, so it's very simple. You actually go and you just change your laser intensity. And, and you, you do it such that you know the chances of getting two of these together is like you know one percent or something like that. Okay. Okay. What what counts is this with Fiona at first or palm when you're doing multiple ones is you want to get out enough photons before it dies that you can because that determines your width. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to take a psi 3 which is a dye attached via DNA you're going to put it on a cover slip and you're going to do it. And you're going to get a picture like this or really there'll be several of them like this. This one blows up here. And what will happen is you'll go and go and go and then all of a sudden it drops down to zero. This is Fiona now. This is not Storm or Palm, just Fiona. And why does it look like this? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because it, it, it dies eventually. And it, if it's one molecule, it, it'll, it'll go either it's on or it's off. You know, either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. But why is the, uh, I'm sorry, why is the intensity of the oxidate at uh, some number, some other number? Ah, it, it, in fact, the, this should be zero. In fact, it, it turns out it's not because your detector puts out a, a certain number. In this case, it's like 30, 34, 3490. And also, the detector actually has certain dark noise. It, it's not ideal. And in fact, to get that dark noise down, because you know the more dark noise, the harder it is to see a single molecule, to get that dark noise down costs about forty thousand dollars. So it you know it's the same as you know the CCD, in your camera, except this is a really good CCD. Is uh, dark noise just like one over F? Or that's what uh, uh, actually, it, ten it tends to be one over F, where F is the frequency. But even at, uh, let's say, a high frequency, it's never zero. Okay, so you can't use like a simple filter? No, no. But it, it, that that's, for now, that's we'll ignore that. Okay, and what if there's two fluorescent molecules here? What will this look like most of the time? <coughs> yeah, it'll look like two steps. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to count all of these photons. Sometimes it'll emit like, well, this is like 5,200 minus 3,500, that's 1,700 counts per whatever, per second or whatever. And then you do it again and you'll get something. And what, what happens is you'll make a histogram with the number of photons versus the likelihood of this happening. And you'll get a curve that looks like this. It typically is single exponential. 
And in this case, it, what is this? It emitted 1.09 million photons, which was the 1 over E. So the, the molecule in general emits a million photons before it dies. And that, that's good. Okay, so you guys will do that. Then what you'll do is, I mentioned about this molecular motor, motor inside your cell. There are three types of molecular motors. One is called kinesin, one is called dynein, and one is called myosin. We're going to take a look at kinesin. Kinesin walks on a particular road. The road is called a microtubule. So what you do... Oh. I don't know how I did that. I don't know. At least you didn't like... Yeah. Um, so this is a, a microtubule. Kinesin walks on it, and it turns out this roadway has a north and has a south, which we call just plus and minus. And kinesin is such that it only walks north. Turns out dynein is another molecular motor which only wa walks south. But we'll, we'll do it with kinesin. Kinesin is a molecular motor which has two legs. And in fact, it comes, it's held together by, by its body. And then up here, it carries a cargo. In this case, it's a, a protein that needs to be moved. In our case, we're going to put a fluorescent molecule on it. Yes? Does it really walk? Yeah. Uh, that, good question. And, and that, in fact, was the question that, uh, well, it got me f a full professorship. Uh, it didn't, I, I had already gotten tenure, but yeah. So exactly that question. Does this thing really walk? We're going to answer that in just a minute. Okay? So, at first, though we're not going to answer that, we're going to answer the question, how far does the thing walk for a given... for uh, a, a given molecule of ATP? You know, because what happens is that you have the feet and it t it, you have the back foot. It takes the energy of ATP. It uses it to actually take a step and go like this. And then the other step goes like this. And so the question is, you know, does it go like that? Or does it, you know, go like this? Or not to prejudice the case, maybe, in fact, it, 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 it does a, a sliding type of motion. But either way, uh, if you measure at its head, up here, it's going to go a certain distance. And we want to measure that. Okay? So what we have here is you have a microtubule, and right there you have a single molecule of, of kinesin labeled with a quantum dot. You give it a little bit of ATP, and it walks. It's pretty amazing. And then you plot it as a function of time, and this is position, 
and look what it, what's happened. At first, it's basically stationary. Then all of a sudden, it gets an ATP, comes up here, and then quickly another gets another ATP, and then comes up here, takes a while, gets another ATP, takes a while, and so forth. So, in fact, what we can do is we can look at the step size of this, and make, we can make a histogram of it, and we find that the thing walks with 8.4 nanometers, plus or minus 0.7 nanometers. Wow. So this is an example of a situation where the kinesin is walking such that the center of mass, the thing up here, is moving 8.4 nanometers. So clearly, in order to resolve this, to get 8.4 nanometers, you clearly needed uh, super accuracy. Clearly much less than 250 nanometers. Okay, yeah. Ah. Why is there, what, okay, uh, I'm, I'm saying, right, uh, I'm saying it moves on average about 8.4 nanometers. Why isn't it always 8.4 nanometers? You know, sometimes it's a little bit less, sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes it's, it's a lot more. Why is that? Okay, you, you asked it, now you can answer it. Well, what 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 kind of experimental error would would cause that? Okay, good. And occasionally, you can measure two steps. That that you control by what? By the amount of ATP that you add. So, in fact, you can go and le add less ATP and. This, the 8.4 nanometers, if your interpretation is correct, uh, that'll stay the constant, but the number of multiple steps will decrease. And, and you do that, and it works. Okay? But that doesn't actually account for the, the width over here. So why, why is it? Why doesn't it always, you know, exactly get 8.4 nanometers? What's that? Is it slippery? Is it slippery? That is possible. Maybe, in fact, what happens is sometimes it walks n 9 nanometers and sometimes 7 nanometers and sometimes 11 nanometers. That, that's possible. But, it, it, but before we come to that conclusion, it, we have to know about or the individual accuracy of like here. For example, that's, you know, 14 nanometers, but it, is it 14 nanometers, you know, plus or minus 0. 0.001 nanometers, or is it 14 nanometers plus or minus 5 nanometers? Well, it, 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 what it, it does depend on the time course. And, and you can see like this one, you, you get the average. Where this one, there's very little time. That it, the total number of photons here is much smaller here than here. So in fact, at each point you'll get some distance, say 14 nanometers, but in fact, there may be, might be plus or minus a big number because each of those points, you collected only a few photons. And that is in fact actually exactly what this is. Works out just fine. So in fact, there, the evidence is, oh, is that it, in fact, walks 
with 8.4 nanometers each time, but that sometimes it does it kind of fast and so you don't get to collect many photons, and sometimes you go kind of slowly and get to collect a bunch of photons. Yes? What about the uh, inherent fluctuation of the kind of quantum dot connection that's moving around? Ah, uh, what about the, the inherent fluctuation that you know, it, it takes a step and, you know, it's going like that. I'm also guessing how you smooth your data matters too, right? Uh, it, yes, the, it, these sorts of things matter. And in fact, you have to go and analyze it, a smoothing function in many different ways, and we do that. Um, the smoothing function actually has a little bit to do with it. Not a lot, but it does have a little bit to do with it. Uh, it you can do uh, either a t-test or you can do an HMM, a hidden Markov method. There are a number of them. Okay. Wow. It's five o'clock. Um, okay. Let me go through let's say in the next five minutes, you know, we're, we're going to be in hyperdrive, okay? Okay, so we did Palm, I mean, I'm sorry, we did Fiona, and by the way, you're going to get this. You're going to get the, the 1 over E time of a, of a floor 4, you're going to attach a fluorofork to kinesin. You're going to get kind of the step. Then you're going to do palm. And again, it, this is the idea, is you have a cell and you label it all over the place, but it's dark. Then you come and you activate it. And then you get your image. And if you get your image at real high intensity, you get the lambda over 2. But in fact, if you do it where you're getting super resolution, you know, this guy turns into this. This guy, you know, turns into that. And notice here, your resolution is sufficiently good. Notice right there there's actually a dark spot. This proved that uh, the, these are what are called clathrin coated pits, that actually there are pits, and that there's a hole in the middle that actually allows things to go through. And what we're going to do, and you're going to do this this week, you're going to take these microtubules that kinesin runs upon. And the microtubules, it turns out, is 13 protofilaments. It's a one, two, three, essentially 13 of them. And by electron microscopy, you know that these microtubules are about 25 nanometers ac across. And the question is, can you actually see this with fluorescence? And the idea is you're going to put a Psi 3, actually it turns out Psi 3B, on it. It's going to be super fluorescent, and that's bad. So you're going to add some chemical called sodium borohydrate in it. and it, it totally will kill the fluorescence. Totally. And then you're going to shine this UV light. In this case, it isn't quite UV. It's four or five nanometers. You're going to activate just a few of the molecules. They activate, so then you shine six 
33 nanometers at them and they'll fluoresce. You'll go and you determine the center of that fluorescence to what within one nanometer or so. You'll, you'll record it and then you'll do it again and again. And you'll see something like this, you know. And then in total, it'll look like that. That's, that's with conventional fluorescence. Woo! Got like, woo! So this is the super resolution. And, oh, the, don't worry about this. Okay. And th that's my five minutes. Okay, so what you will do this week, you will either do Fiona or you will uh, Fiona on, I think, you'll get to Kinesin. And Storm, you'll get to measure this microtubule where you can see much less than the lambda over two. Okay, thanks a lot guys.